I've never seen anyone that is more into their craft than you. He told me, he said, Joey, I'm never feeling that again. I will never feel this <laughs> feeling again. Three white lights. And how is that a second attempt? And this guy is all types of Jack. He's going to pull this. I think he's going to pull it. The guy has a ton of muscle in all the right places. And there is your 83 kilo world champion. How the f do you keep getting stronger? <laughs>Deion Sanders, Allen Iverson, and Mike Tyson, three men who came into their sports with a level of flash and bravado that hadn't been seen before. Some would see it as braggadocious and loud, while others would see it as a display of confidence and swagger. But regardless of how you may see them, there's no denying that their auras left a strong impression in their respective sports, while simultaneously creating a constant buzz around their names. Add to that the fact that the performances and talent were able to match their brazen swagger, and you have athletes who, with the right amount of self-promotion, can garner a fan base and a movement that doesn't just take over an entire sport, but influence an entire generation as well. While the powerlifting world hadn't been known for having any major personalities throughout the course of the sport's history, that would change with the rise and success of one man. A man who successfully leveraged social media to blaze a trail in powerlifting that would create a massive movement rejuvenating the sport in a way nobody could imagine, while simultaneously continuing to test the boundaries of what he was capable of. While some may call him the king of the 83 kg, I call him the Fresh Prince of Powerlifting. Russell Orhi was born December 9, 1994 in San Antonio, Texas to Nigerian-born immigrants Paul and Eugenia Orhi. His father is the former Director General of Nigeria's Food and Drug Administration, abbreviated as NAFDAC. Russ was actually named after Russell Reeder, an American researcher and professor of cell systems and anatomy at the University of Texas Health Science Center. He helped Russ's father make major breakthroughs in his career, and for that support, he earned the right to be his child's namesake. He grew up in Houston, Texas, and went to George Ranch High School in Richmond. Growing up, Russ wasn't overly skinny or overweight. He was always in between. He was also an avid sports fanatic, citing Bo Jackson as one of his greatest inspirations due to his deadly combination of speed and power. This was something that Russ drew inspiration from when he decided to play football himself. Standing 5'6 and weighing 185 pounds, Russ was a stocky little tank. Mostly, like, the main focus was football. Running I mean, back? Yeah. Yeah. Damn, he'd be hard to bring down with those big ass legs. Yeah. <laughs> that was the thing. Like, I was super short to the ground, and then, like, my legs were, like, a lot bigger than some of the other Kind of like Barry were. Sanders back in the day. That guy had huge legs. No, nah, I wasn't. I wasn't shifty like that. But playing football was the driving factor behind his introduction into the gym. As any athlete knows, consistency in the weight room yields results on the field. Having become acquainted with the weight room, Russ fell in love with training. So much so that he looked forward to workouts simply due to the enjoyment that he got out of it. This enjoyment, however, quietly began to produce some serious gains. By junior year of high school, Russ was benching 365 and squatting 565, all without a proper strength training program. To be able to put up those numbers at a sub 200 pound body weight as a teenager was extremely impressive. The strength he had accumulated up until this point had come from the work he was putting in the weight room for football work that was establishing an incredibly strong foundation of strength. By senior year of high school, this strength began to reflect on his physique, as Russ started to get swole. Just like his favorite anime character, Goku. It would be in his high school forensic science class that the name Russ and Swole would merge, creating the athlete's signature brand name and moniker. Anyone who's played high school sports, especially football, knows that every notable player on the team generally has some kind of nickname. For William Perry, it was The Refrigerator. For Marshawn Lynch, it was Beast Mode. And for Russ, it was Russ Bus, likely due to his stocky build perfectly suited for running people over. Russ, however, was never a fan of this nickname and was definitely ready for a change. He wanted something that was more mature and had a better ring for social media. Having been a heavy Instagram and Twitter user, Russ understood the importance of having a good and catchy handle. So it was in this forensic science class that his buddy Matt suggested the name Russ Soul because of the double entendre with his first name, Russ Soul. Not to mention Russ's identifying characteristic being his muscular physique. And thus, the legend of Russ Swole was born. After graduating high school in 2012, Russ enrolled at the University of Houston, where he majored in kinesiology. Given his love and passion for training, kinesiology was a logical choice for a major. But when it came to his football career, Russ was at a crossroads. Like most people, he realized that his potential and ceiling for football had been met. And it was time to transition his energy into something else. Russ was perfectly okay with that because at that point, he had realized that he enjoyed lifting weights and building his physique more than he enjoyed football, because according to Russ, he didn't do it for himself. 
I used to play football, so all my workouts used to be performance based so I could get better on the field. And I ended up losing my interest in the sport because I was kind of doing it for everyone else and I wasn't really doing it for my own satisfaction. So he decided to dedicate his time and effort into his fitness journey moving forward, starting at LA Fitness and other commercial gyms. Now, long before the fitness content wave had exploded, there were very few casual gym goers recording and documenting their fitness journeys. Russ, however, was one of them. He would record daily to keep a personal journal of his progress and evolution. What he didn't realize at the time was that he would be laying the foundation of what would become his massive brand. This period didn't come without a bit of boredom, however. Any former athlete who's made the transition knows that going from a competitive lifestyle to a non-competitive one is exceedingly difficult, especially when you already have a high competitive mindset. This is the reason so many former high school and college athletes pursue new passions and competitive outlets to continue to fuel that competitive fire. But when we look at the options available, there are two options that stand out in terms of legitimacy and popularity, bodybuilding and powerlifting. The foundation he built from his training in high school stood out at LA Fitness, given the fact that most commercial gym goers are not lifting the entire gym like Russ, a reality which prompted his gym partner to throw out the statement that started so many legendary careers. You should power lift. With that came a new interest in powerlifting and what it had to offer. Russ's high school did not have a powerlifting program, nor did he know many powerlifters himself. But an opportunity to test the waters in a sport he wasn't familiar with was a challenge he was more than willing to accept. What made things even better was the University of Houston had a powerlifting club, which Russ joined to learn more about the sport. He didn't have much of a starting point other than the numbers he knew he could hit, so his overall potential was not something he could accurately measure without having stuff on the platform. So when he joined the University of Houston's powerlifting club, he embarked on his powerlifting journey with the goal and the intent to be the best powerlifter on the planet. Now, to be the best, you've got to beat the best. So he asked his coach who the best powerlifter in his weight class was, to which he responded, John Hack. I don't want to be like just the best IPF, USPA lifter. I want to be like the best overall. Mm -hmm. And I saw like conquering the IPF as just like one of the stepping stones to that. Russ had never heard of this name before and subtly downplayed him. However, he quickly realized that not only was John much stronger than him, but he was also one year older than him, meaning that the best 83 kilogram powerlifter in the country was another young up and comer. So for Russ, the path to number one was going to be grueling and the pressure would be unlike anything he's ever experienced tenfold. But regardless of that, he was ready. Not only ready to embrace the grueling nature of the rise to the top, but ready to embrace every obstacle and roadblock that comes with it as well. With John Hack as his barometer and a new competitive fire lit, Russ refocused his training to cater to his powerlifting goals. He also refocused his social media content to document his growth and progress as a powerlifter. The documentation never ended up achieving any early claim or fame given the fact that it wasn't trendy yet, but Russ just wanted people to not only watch him pursue his new passion, but watch the progress he would make over time. He created his YouTube account in 2015 and posted his first video in August of that year titled Arm Day with Russ Swole. The video takes the viewer through a hypertrophy arm session with some background music and minimal edits as a young Russ Swole cruises through an intense workout. He very quickly immersed himself and his content within that early fitness wave as he got more and more comfortable on camera. He switched back and forth between music video style edits and more personal style videos where he gave intros and even narration of what he was doing. Getting comfortable in front of a camera was not difficult for Russ because at the end of the day, he was just having fun and educating other people in the process. This led to Russ slowly building up a bigger community on YouTube as he'd get more and more engagement in every video. Russ's ninth video on YouTube was titled This Is Who I Am and was posted October 26, 2015. In this video, he gives all of his supporters more insight into the man behind the physique and what he was looking to accomplish, giving his early supporters a better connection to him. This video also gives some detail and insight into the specifics of his motivation to compete and where that motivation stems from. Okay, let's get on to the topic I want to discuss in this video, and that's me. <laughs> well, let me reintroduce myself to this ghost movie. My name is Russell Forty. 20 years old and I'm from Houston, Texas, or Sugarland if you guys want to get more specific. I thought I loved playing sports, but I enjoyed working out more. So I started to focus more on bodybuilding, aesthetics, instead of going to the gym to become a better football player. I want to help people start their fitness journey. I want to help people who are already on it. I just want to share my journey and hope that it helps you get started with anything you want to start. It could be about fitness, art, schools, anything. It doesn't have to be fitness. 
I just want to have my personal journey shared with you guys and have other people do theirs as well. As he put it in the video, he wanted to inspire others to start their fitness journeys by watching and following his own. And with only a few videos uploaded, he was well on his way to accomplishing that. It would be only one month after this video was uploaded that he compete at his very first powerlifting meet on November 7th, 2015. He competed at the USAPL Raw Collegiate Cup representing the University of Houston. The first competition is typically the one where a competitor gets their feet wet. Russ, however, jumped right into the water, going 9 for 9 on all of his lifts and totaling 1,510 pounds, 540.1 pound squat, 363.7 pound bench, and a 606.2 pound deadlift to end his first meet and dominate the junior division at just 20 years old. He won best overall male lifter and got in the books with a dot score of 466.27. Now, for those who don't know what a dot score is, it's a mathematical calculation which takes into account an athlete's body weight relative to their total weight lifted. This was introduced in the late 1980s by powerlifter Michael Song to better measure an athlete's true strength. So essentially, if you have two athletes who lift the same exact amount of weight at a competition, the athlete with a lighter body weight will have the higher dot score and technically be the stronger lifter. Russ's 466.27 dot score was the highest of the entire meet. This performance would be the foundation for the rise of Russ Wool, as every competitor, judge, and spectator would clearly see the potential. To total over 1,500 pounds at a first powerlifting meet is an exceptionally impressive task especially as an 83 kilogram lifter. But to also do that beltless while having minimal experience deadlifting was some disgusting work. But for us, this was still only the beginning and he was still chasing the shadow of John Hack. John had competed the month prior at the USAPL Raw Nationals and totaled 1,736 pounds while winning the Open as a 22 year old junior. So suffice to say, Russ still had a ways to go. A reality that made his fire to compete burn even harder. He also wasn't close to satisfied with his numbers at the first meet and felt that he left a lot on the platform. Having proven to himself that he had what it took to make a legitimate impact as a powerlifter, Russ needed to see if that talent can translate over to the bodybuilding stage. With his original goal entailing him wanting to be an aesthetic powerlifter or power builder, it only made sense that he would push the bounds of his aesthetics the same way he did with his strength. So what he would do is incorporate a hypertrophy split within his powerlifting split to get the best of both worlds. He would hit his powerlifting movements and then his bodybuilding ones, a method that's traditionally been against the standards of powerlifting. See, most powerlifters who are dedicated to powerlifting alone typically only train the core powerlifting movements while minimizing or even completely excluding accessory movements. But Russ was not a conventional powerlifter and felt that his hybrid style of training was a big factor in his dense muscle tissue. So as long as it was sustainable for him and still allowed him to progress in one way or another, he was going to continue on that path. Now, despite not knowing where his pursuit of content would take him, Russ had an entrepreneurial mind and wanted to go all in in the fitness space and take advantage of his potential opportunities. He grew up loving fashion and clothing, so he launched his own clothing brand called Get Better Today, or GBT for short. The name was inspired by the closing words of all of his YouTube videos, words that he lived by. If you like it, please comment, like, share, and subscribe. Get better today. I'm out. 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 There's like this one quote from one of the characters, it's Rock Lee. Mm -hmm. It's if I could get 1% better each and every single day, then like something, something. Like I strive for perfection or something like that. I was like, damn, that's dope. So in my, <laughs> in my YouTube videos, I'll close the video out by saying, get better today. Like get better today, get better today. And like I would write it on my board and all that. And it just kind of stuck. In January of 2016, popular fitness influencer Christian Guzman opened up Alpha Elite Gym and had a grand opening that was met with a ton of anticipation. Alpha Elite at the time was an up and coming clothing brand that was gaining some serious traction within the fitness community, and Guzman was looking to expand. So it was only natural for Russ, who was already a follower of the brand, to ingratiate himself within the Alpha Elite community and get some content in the process. Russ's first day at the Alpha Elite Gym marked the beginning of the growth of his social network within the industry. It was the community that he had been looking for and the atmosphere that he needed to maximize his training. And that 585 PR that he hit most definitely exemplified that. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Oh my God. So he got a membership at the Athlete Gym and continued to build his personal brand. He'd give fans more insight into his training regimen and how it had been progressing. Around this time, he started a series called the Powerlifting Chronicles, which specifically detailed his prep for the next meet and highlighted what his brand had become known for. 
lifting really heavy weight. At this time, Russ was still in college working towards his degree while trying to balance his content. He reportedly spent five to seven hours a day at the gym training and recording content. He didn't have a full-time videographer, so doing it all himself, he needed to set up his camera at different angles throughout his workout in order to really maximize the quality of his videos. This level of dedication did not go unnoticed though, as Christian Guzman was impressed. Building his own brand and understanding the benefits of influencer marketing, Guzman saw something in Russ that many other people saw, his hard work and dedication to his craft. This was very much in line with the brand identity of Alphalete and what Alphalete is supposed to represent. So Christian offered Russ his first sponsorship which came with a nice salary and commission code. This also came with the honorable distinction of being Alphalete's very first sponsored athlete, effectively making him the new face of the brand. A status that garnered him over 20,000 followers seemingly overnight and marked a pivotal moment in Russ's fitness journey and growth as an influencer. I got a quick announcement. I have joined the Alphalete family. Man, it's, it's, I'm truly thankful and truly, like, it's just, like I said before, man, I told myself this year is gonna be the year that I start putting my print in this industry, in the fitness industry, YouTube, social media, whatever you want to say. Um, I told myself to start this year, January 1st, I sat down outside uh, my house and I was just looking, like I was just looking at, you know, the fence and like looking at stuff. I'm like, I'm tired of making excuses. I'm tired of, of everything coming down to me saying, well, you know, maybe next time or something. I'm like, no, it's time to, the time is now. This is only the beginning. This is only the beginning. This is so fun. I'm enjoying the process. I like learning new things. I like meeting new people. This is so, so fun to me. This is what I want. And this is what I'm passionate about. I'm so happy to really, to just like, you know, say I'm part of the Alphalete family now. So I'm an Alphalete athlete, officially. That ascension to the next level got so many eyes on him that he was able to nab his first supplement sponsor, BPN Subs, one of the biggest supplement manufacturers in the world. So just like that, Russ's hobby had become a full-blown career which came with some new responsibilities. Still being in college inevitably complicated things due to him being spread so thin. He was quickly approaching a crossroads in terms of what he was going to devote his time to. Realizing that he spent way more time at the gym than in class, Russ decided to drop out of college his junior year to focus strictly on his powerlifting career and building his brand. So, in this process, I became an athlete athlete. My social media started growing a little bit more, and I was getting opportunities that I feel like most trainers that are coming out with a college degree were looking for. So basically what I'm saying is that what I was going to college for I was getting the opportunities in the middle of my college career. At this point, I was making pretty decent money through YouTube, um, through like the sponsorships that I was getting, also just like little coaching here and there on the side. And I was like, man, you know, I want to put my full effort into my social media and see what can, where this could take me. I was, I feel like I was, I have a window with the social media thing. I wanted to capitalize on that as much as I could. So I went to my parents, I told them what I was thinking about. Initially, they, they, you know, I'm Nigerian, so initially they disagreed. They weren't with it at all. They were acting like they were fighting it a lot. But I laid down the foundation. I showed them my ideas. I showed them that I was actually able to sustain myself with the money I was making through social media, and they agreed. Ultimately, his desire to make it as a powerlifter and entrepreneur was significantly greater than that of a kinesiologist or a professional alike. He was blessed with gifts that many people could only dream of, and he realized very early on that he needed to maximize it. In February of 2016, he competed at his second meet at the Aggie Showdown. He put up a 562.1 pound squat, a 369.2 pound bench, and a 639.3 pound deadlift, all significant improvements from his first meet. While his bench had only increased by 6 pounds, his squat and deadlift both saw increases of over 20 pounds on each lift, which for a 3 month gap is highly impressive. Russ, however, did note after his first meet, he was left unsatisfied and felt that he had more left in the tank. Hence why he was so eager to jump into another meet so soon. He knew that he wasn't even close to scratching the surface of his potential. Having had a love for aesthetics and hypertrophy training, the idea of testing his skill in bodybuilding piqued his interest and presented yet another avenue that could fuel his competitive nature. He spent the middle portion of 2016 preparing for his NPC debut, a prep which he admits he could have done a better job of maximizing. I got second, so... Is this the only bodybuilding show you ever done? Yeah. Do, yeah. Did you have to do um, cardio and stuff like that for oh, the yeah. show too? Yeah. Yeah, but I wasn't... <laughs> 
<laughs> I wasn't doing everything I should have been doing. Yeah. Let's say that. Like I would uh, every Thursday I have this thing with like uh, the cheese checks mix. Mm. I would eat like a bag of that every Thursday. Which, like, in hindsight, like, that, was, <laughs> that was fucking stupid. <laughs> I just thought that I'm like, well, I mean, it's a bag of checks mix. Like, what is it going to do? You know? Yeah. He competed at the 2016 Lee Labrada Classic in August, where he placed second in the middleweight division in men's bodybuilding. His conditioning could have been a lot better, which makes sense given his novice approach to his first show. Despite this, Russ displayed some very impressive genetics for bodybuilding. At only 21 years old, his pec development was the absolute standout feature on his physique. His arms and shoulders were perfectly proportioned for his frame, and his quad sweep and separation highlighted his very impressive lower body. Again, conditioning was the biggest area of improvement, but for a first-time competitor, it was clear that the foundation was there. I would say probably just like my conditioning, like whenever I get mm. down to that body weight, because I know like the first time I did a show, that was like something I struggled with just because I didn't respect the sport mm. as much, if I'm being honest. Like mm. it was my first time doing it, and I thought that like, ah, oh, like, I'm lean enough, like I'm fine. Then when I got when I got to that stage, I was like, God damn. But what was even clearer was that Russ's long-term potential as a powerlifter was greater than that of bodybuilding. So Russ quickly put his bodybuilding career on hold to focus strictly on powerlifting and moving heavy weight. Four months later, he competed at his third meet at the absolutely stacked 2016 Southern Regional Championships. This time in the 93 kg or 205 pound class. Now, he did come in 14 pounds underweight, but that didn't stop him from once again dominating the competition. Russ once again went 9 for 9, putting up a 633.8 pound squat, a 385.8 pound bench, and a 666.9 pound deadlift. Moving up a weight class for this meet did not affect his overall strength progression as he hit a dot score of 503.98, which represented an increase of 21.34 points from his previous dot score. Now, this wasn't the best of the meet. In fact, it ranked 8th overall and 3rd in the open class. He did only compete in juniors and dominated taking the first place medal. But given his impending move to exclusively compete in the open, this wasn't satisfactory. He needed to be able to hang with the big boys, because he wasn't going to be a junior forever. And once he stepped up to the open, he needed to hit numbers that he knew would measure up. While Russ did relatively well at 205, it wasn't the weight where he could optimize his strength. So for his next meet, he decided to move back to the 83 kg class. He'd hit the platform once again in February of 2017, returning to the Aggie showdown where he put up dramatically improved numbers from his last 83 kg showing. He finished with a 617.3 pound squat, a 391.3 pound bench, and a 677.9 pound deadlift, totaling 1686.5 pounds. This matched the total from his previous meet at 93 kg, but this time giving him a 517.50 dot score a 7.2% increase from his last 83 kg performance. He not only dominated the junior division once again, but also dominated the open in another very stacked meet. He finished with the highest raw dot score and once again turned some heads. Despite the impressive performance, this was the meet where Russ was met with his first humbling moments. He failed his final squat attempt as well as his final deadlift, something which he surely stewed on after the meet. But his first victory in the open class solidified to Russ that 83 kg was where he needed to be, so he continued to focus on dominating that division. That dominance continued in August of 2017 at the USAPL Texas Raw Championships where Russ truly showed out. Aside from hitting new personal bests in all three movements, Russ added 60 pounds to his total in a span of 6 months and had the biggest deadlift in the entire meet at 688.9 pounds. He not only dominated the junior division and open class once again, but he lifted almost 300 pounds more than the runner-up at this meet. This level of dominance combined with the level of enthusiasm Russ was bringing to the platform set the stage for a highly anticipated Nationals debut, as those who had been following his journey couldn't wait to see how he stacked up with the best in the nation. Just like trying to get my mind right a little bit. Like I was in there just seeing the crowd and everything like that. So it's like I need to sit down, relax, chill, get off my feet, and just get ready to compete. The biggest meet that I've competed in so far. So. <sighs> just got to calm down. Russ entered his first national meet in Florida at the USAPL Raw Nationals on October 10, 2017, at just 22 years old. Given the short time frame from his last meet, his goal was to not only get his toes wet at nationals, but to truly test whether he was on his way to being one of the best powerlifters in his class. The prize money at nationals was only $1,000, so everyone who was competing on that stage was truly hungry to win. 
Throughout his entire powerlifting career thus far, Russ had been on the heels of John Hack, and as poetic as it would be for the both of them to square off at Russ's first nationals, this would not come to fruition. See, just one year prior, John Hack, at just 23 years old, went to the IPF World Championships and won. He had ran through the best 83 kg lifters in the world and had nothing left to prove at tested competitions. So he left the USAPL in favor of non-tested federations to continue to push the bounds of his strength. This meant that Russ's biggest obstacle and the throne were there for the taking. Now, despite John not being present, his numbers were still in the books and a measure for Russ to shoot for. Russ came out of the gates hard, finishing with a 662.5 squat, breaking John Hack's national record by 1.1 pounds. Russ didn't come close to John's bench with a best of 396.8, 33 pounds short of John's 429.9. I have an obligation to my sport, mm -hmm. so when I'm inside the gym, I don't play any games. Really just, I'm so laser focused, the only thing I care about is making sure that I'm in a mental mind state that allows me to lift the most way I could possibly do. Deadlift was pretty close as Russ finished with a 688.9, 5.5 pounds short of John's best. At the end of the day, Rush finished with a total of 1,748.2 pounds and a dot score of 538.77, a slight increase from his last meet. Improving on his squat while breaking the national record was a massive feat in that time frame. He saw a slight reduction on his bench from the previous meet but was able to match his deadlift. Russ having the ability to put up a better squat in that amount of time showed how advanced he was in that movement. His mechanics, his depth, and control of the eccentric at that immense of a load was far advanced for a lifter his age. Rush showed up to nationals with the intent of staking his claim as the national 83 kilogram king, and he left with not just that title, but the squat record as well. He was well on his way to accomplishing the goal that he set at the beginning of his powerlifting journey, to be the best powerlifter he could be. And that effort led him to be crowned junior and open national champion, the best in America. Now, if powerlifting was exclusive to the United States, it would be the end of the Russell story. But there was an entire world of powerlifters across the sea who Russ had yet to compete against. At this point, it was clearer, now more than ever, that he wasn't just an average powerlifter. Hell, he wasn't the average human. He had been competing in powerlifting for just under two years and was five competitions deep into his career, seeing massive progress. Progress that would not go unnoticed. It was around this time that he'd meet Joey Flex, one of the best coaches in all of powerlifting and the owner of Flex Training Systems. Joey built his name as an elite powerlifter in the USAPA and USAPL, and he went on to dedicate his life to creating other elite powerlifters. Priding himself on constant communication and getting the best out of every single one of his athletes, Russ's union with Joey was a move that was surely meant to catapult his progress to new heights as one of the most elite powerlifters in the world. This didn't mean that he would completely abandon hypertrophy training though, because Russ still loved incorporating it into his program. So much so that he told Joey he'd stop powerlifting entirely if he didn't allow him to diversify his training, and Joey of course acquiesced. Now, Russ's fan base in the powerlifting community was skyrocketing at this point, as he was slowly creeping towards John Hack in terms of notoriety. His progress was something that was seldom seen in powerlifting, but what was gaining more attention was his brand identity and name. Russ's social media platforms had begun buzzing and growing as he was revolutionizing the newest powerlifting scene without even realizing it. The Alphalete gym began crawling with other powerlifters who wanted to be around Russ and his movement. Because of Russ, more and more powerlifters began flocking the gym in search for a powerlifting community within the Houston area. Russ wasn't just an Alphalete athlete, he was becoming bigger. The growing powerlifting community had been officially put on notice as Russ was getting the attention of the press who would marvel at his impressive numbers. Becoming a national champion put him in a different realm altogether. At just 23 years old, Russ now had a name and brand image that he could maximize to build wealth. His social media savvy and ability to market himself was one of the tools that made that possible. Russ knew how to captivate an audience and get people invested in his journey, not just because of his talent, but his personality as well. If he was going to continue to claim to be the best, he knew he needed to continue to compete with them, and in the process challenge himself like the natural born competitor he had always been. He was now a pro and would need to prove himself among the pro ranks. He'd go full steam into prepping for the biggest meet of his entire life, IPF Worlds. IPF Worlds has always been the pinnacle of drug tested powerlifting. 
Winning worlds immediately skyrockets you into powerlifting royalty, like it had done for John Hack and so many lifters before him. If Russ was going to show out, he'd need to gain some momentum and continue to build his confidence. But as Russ would learn, it wasn't always smooth sailing, and the grind to the top would come with a consistent amount of struggle. In March of 2018, he competed at the Arnold SBD Pro American where he saw his worst performance in his last three meets. Russ was only able to hit a 633.8 pound squat as he missed his next two attempts at 661.4 pounds each. He fared better in the bench, matching his all-time PR at 402.3. His deadlift saw a minor reduction as he hit 683.4, which while not his worst deadlift at comp, it was a few pounds off from his best. You know, obviously, I didn't hit the numbers that I came and like put in my head to hit, but I mean, at the end of the day, you take what the day is giving you, and it's like, I got greedy, and I, I got humped, and that's what it is, man. Like, I'm looking forward to my next training cycle because I know that this poor performance is going to fuel my training going forward, and I get to eat a donut. Russ faltering in his second and third squat attempts was really what hurt his overall performance. If he makes the second or third attempt at 661, he'd end up with a dot score one point off from what he had at nationals. Instead, he'd finish with a 528.48, which was 10 points lower. So while on paper his performance seemed like a relatively big setback, it was really one movement that made the difference. But after all, this is the nature of powerlifting. Missing an attempt can be the difference between winning your class or coming in third. For Russ, however, it didn't matter. He still finished in first place, dominating his other two 83kg competitors, with a second place finisher putting up a total that was 200 pounds less than Russ's. Now, at this point in his career, he hadn't been beaten at a meet. Six meets, six first place finishes, and Russ not only surpassed his expectations when he began his powerlifting journey, but he was validated in pursuing powerlifting over bodybuilding. Russ was undoubtedly built for it, and there was nowhere to go but up. Now, in terms of social media content, Russ had gotten his brand to a high level with his own effort. This would change in 2018 though, with his introduction to the person who would become one of the most pivotal pieces to his operation, Duhan. Russ learned of Duhan when he would pop up to local gyms in the area offering to photograph influencers for free. He was working as a full-time forklift operator and freelancing on the side, but in an effort to really jumpstart his dreams, he took a chance and DM'd every big name in Houston, with Russ being one of them. Being a huge fan of his brand and his content, he wanted the opportunity to work with him, and Russ gave him that shot. And after seeing the work that the kid was able to produce, he kept him in the back of his mind. Being able to work with Russ Rowe was a huge milestone for him, and he quickly realized the opportunity he had to take a chance on himself and chase his dreams in the process. He knew he had the skills to provide value to Russ and GBT, he just had to prove it. So, Duan quit his job and offered to be Russ's full-time content creator. Recognizing the lengths that he went to to create this opportunity for himself and also put himself out there to pursue his passion, Russ took a chance on him and brought him onto the team due to the dedication it took to take that risk. While Russ was a bit skeptical at first and struggled with the idea of ceding creative control over to someone else, it was clear that Duhan really wanted an opportunity and he wasn't going to squander it. So from then on, he helped Russ elevate his social media content to a new level, with more cinematic and captivating content that would appeal to a broader audience of people with powerlifting being the subject. With the addition of Duhan to the team, there was no limit to how big GBT or his personal brand could grow from a creative aspect. The success of Duhan helped Russ realize that he couldn't do everything, and it was probably better for his brand that he didn't. He needed to find more Duhans that he could put in positions to succeed across his entire fitness ecosystem. Now, with the IPF World Championships just three months away, Russ was deep in prep for his biggest and most career-defining meet. Yeah, we're, we're a week out. When this video comes out, it's going to be six days out, so... Like I said earlier, it's just about sticking to the game plan, uh, making sure I'm recovering properly, and just... Worlds would be absolutely pivotal, as he would attempt to stake his claim as not just the king of the 83kg, but one of the best powerlifters on the planet. Alright, so uh, today's the day. Today's the day we compete. Um, it's not much to say, man. We're here. About to start warming up for squats. Alright, cool. <laughs> <laughs> With the meet underway, Russ came out with a very strong start on squats, nailing his first two attempts with ease and finishing with a squat of 658 pounds, which was his second best all time. From a smile to all business, <laughs> he is calm. He is almost a little too calm. 
Now, when it was time to bench, he put on his best all-time performance and really came to play. He opened up with his heaviest bench opener ever at 391.3, a number which just at his last meet was his second attempt. He would hit a 418.8 pound bench on his final attempt, which was a 16 and a half pound increase from his all-time bench PR. Russell's been really working on his bench press. Yeah. Um, he knows that was his weakness coming into this, and he's working really hard to improve on it. And it looks like he has based off of that. Second attempt here. Yeah. 185 is pretty good. Finished up last attempt on bench, ended up being, what was it, a 7.5 KGPR? Yeah, 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 so like, what is that, 420? Or 418. 414? 418. 418, okay, 418, 418. So, uh, I mean, feels good, so. Now, going all out on bench may have fatigued Russ a little more than he anticipated, because he started off deadlifts a lot more conservatively than he had in the last few meets. His opening attempt was 628.3 and he followed that up with a 650.3 deadlift, his lowest second attempt since 2016. To further emphasize Russ's underwhelming deadlift performance, his final attempt at 661.4 was actually 1.1 pounds lighter than his best squat all time. And he couldn't get it up. This is something that he's hit many times in training. And he's pulling it to fight at the knees. Just a little heavy. So with his best squat being 658 and his best deadlift being 650, Russ had officially squatted more than he deadlifted at a competition. A complete anomaly in powerlifting. Primarily because the mechanics of a deadlift should technically allow a competitor to deadlift more weight than they squat, assuming the movement is done correctly. Hence why in the powerlifting world, it's expected that a competitor's biggest lift comes during the deadlifts and not the other way around. A short turnaround time for Worlds, combined with Russ emptying the tank on bench, likely led to him getting gassed by the time deadlifts rolled around, resulting in his weakest deadlift performance since his first year of powerlifting. However, as a competitor, all he could do was go out and give it his best attempt, which is exactly what he did. This resulted in the first second place placing of his career, which, to happen on the world stage, is incredible to us mere mortals. However, to Russ, who had been the most dominant 83kg force in America since John Hack, this was painful. But there was a silver lining. He was still only 23 years old, three years into his career, and outperformed by someone older and significantly stronger than him. The 2018 83kg world champion Brett Gibbs had the third highest dot score of the meet and totaled 103.6 pounds more than Russ. Brett's got a smile. He doesn't look very concerned right now. He knows he's having the day of his life. I would not bet against them. The crowd is on their feet. And Brett Gibbs does it the heaviest 10 times body weight total in IPF. Even if Russ nails his final deadlift, he still would have been too far behind. 93 pounds to be exact. The only close movement was the squat, to which Brett was only up by one pound. The discrepancies in the bench and the deadlift were just too large of a gap, so simply put, Russ lost to the better powerlifter, a pill which from any competitor is relatively easier to swallow. That still didn't take away from the sting of not being able to walk away number one, but for Russ, this was just more fuel to add to the competitive fire. For 75% of this meet, I was sure that I was going to lose, but what I want to kind of like make that into a message is that like, look man, even if things look kind of bleak, you want to follow through, you want to keep doing what you got to do in order to push through because you never know what could happen in the end. Four months after 2018 Worlds, Russ went back to the USAPL Nationals to defend his crown, this time with a vengeance. In the squat, he matched his best opener at 633.8 and made a huge jump to 663.6 in hitting it. This not only nabbed him a new PR, but broke his national squat record from the year before. So you can't just tie and win on body weight, you got to... You Absolutely. gotta actually exceed it by two and a half kilos. It can, right. really, can really mess with you a lot. This is his second attempt, remember. He's got so much room on a third if he makes this. I don't know, that was, that was quick, but we gotta see how it looks. He tried to PR again on his last attempt at 679, but it did not go. Despite that, Russ was already off to a very strong start. And that could cause a seismic shift right there. It could. Between the two of them. 
and like I buried it. I came out and I was like, damn, like it's not, it's not moving. And then, you know, obviously you guys saw I failed the rep. So from that point on, I had put it inside of my head that look, I think I just lost. I think I just got second place. So on the bench platform, he once again opened up at his heaviest bench opener yet at 402.3, a number which was his all time PR just seven months prior. He missed his second attempt at 413.3, but matched his 418.8 PR on his final attempt. Enough to improve on his last meet and still give him juice to max out deadlifts, a movement he should always dominate. Five missed attempts over seven competitions. Now, walks away with the W. He opened up fairly conservatively because he was planning on making a big jump. He went from a 633.8 opener to 661.4 for his second attempt. With his performance from Worlds haunting him, Russ made sure to body his second attempt and route to a big deadlift. 683.4 pounds was loaded onto the bar, a number that Russ had hit before. So for Russ, it was easy money. Your gold medal position lifter, Russell Orhe. 10 kilo jump, 310, 683. Locked it in, all smiles. New national champion, Russell Orhe. That deadlift would cap off his best overall performance yet, walking away with a 1,765.9 pound total, a 541 dot score, and the title of a two-time national champion. His star had been shining so bright, and there was no doubt to his greatness and rightful place as one of the best powerlifters in the world. But he still longed for that world championship hardware. 2018 IPF Worlds was the first time in Russ's entire powerlifting career that he hadn't finished in first. Finishing in second place and finishing by such a large margin laid the groundwork for what he'd have to do in the offseason to come back and be the undisputed best in the world. He was missing certain lifts and um, both a little more experience. He's coming in here now with that. He's definitely dangerous. Eight months after Nationals, Russ and crew pulled up to Sweden for the 2019 IPF World Championships. With the improvements Russ had been making heading into the meet, plus the momentum he was gaining, the anticipation for how he would perform was at an all-time high. Add to that the fact that the reigning champ would be back to defend his crown, and the men's 83kg class was set to be one of the most exciting clashes at Worlds in years. When the platform was ready for Russ to hit his first squat, he set the tone for what he was planning to be the Russell Orhe show. It's almost scary to think where he might go. Walks out fairly confidently. Oh, wow. But not a single expression on his face either. He opened up with his biggest squat opener ever at 639.3 and route to a PR of 673.5, 10 pounds heavier than his last squat PR. Russ, however, was not done. A 10 pound increase on his squat was not indicative of the work that he had put in in the past eight months leading up to that meet. So he made another 16 and a half pound jump to a massive 690 that he got up clean and in the process set his first ever world record in the squat. Whoa, oh, oh my tank. goodness, he's done oh, wow. it. 313 by an 83 kilo lifter, three white lights, whoa. What history being made. Russ wanted to start off his second crack at Worlds with a bang, and he did exactly that. Moving on to the bench press, it was a similar story. He opened up with 402.3, then matched his all-time best of 418.8 on his second attempt, the smoothest he had hit it so far. So for Russ, a big bench PR was on the horizon. 429.9 was loaded on the bar for Russ's final bench attempt, and he nailed it with ease. Now, if it wasn't clear that Russ was on pace for his best performance all time, it would be clear once deadlifts came up. Uh, metal contention due to his deadlift, because he has the ability, if he pulls after you, load the bar with what he needs and try to take your metal. The theme for Russ's meet so far had been big numbers and big improvements. Contrary to 2018 Worlds, Russ was actually in contention for the crown. See, at this point at 2018 Worlds, Russ was 51.1 pounds behind Brett Gibbs. In 2019, however, that discrepancy was 6.7 pounds, with Russ being in the lead. His drastic improvements, combined with Gibbs' regression from 2018, was setting the stage for a tight finish. Russ opened up with a big 666.9 pound deadlift, his biggest opener of all time, 
Gibbs opened up with the same weight and nailed that as well. For his second attempt, Russ made a huge jump to 694.4, which was a 5.5 pound increase from his previous PR, and he absolutely nailed it. In a tight race, Gibbs hit the same number with ease, so it was literally going to come down to the final deadlift, and at this point, it was Russ's meat to lose. Russ still needed to hit his final attempt of 716.5 pounds, the first 700 pound attempt of his entire career, and an 83 kg world deadlift record if he could get it. This one was for all the marbles, and the redemption that Russ had been looking for. Making history, Russell Lohe. Knowing he was behind, Gibbs was going to attempt a pretty big deadlift to make up the gap. He attempted a 711 pound deadlift which he missed, effectively ending his chances at regaining the title. Here it is. He's pulling! Come on, up to no. A little too much today. And Russell Orhe has just won the world championships. And with that lift, Russell Orhe was officially the undisputed best 83 kg lifter in the world. And as a powerlifting community would later call him, the king of the 83s. And the new deadlift world record holder for that weight class. Holy man. Holy shit. Oh my God, man. Holy shit. That was, uh... I don't even know what to say. Like, Joey's more hyped than I am because it's just kind of like... Bro, because to go through what he went through last year, to come back, yeah. had an adversity, back injury, take one on yeah, the yeah. chin. Yeah. He got smacked. He told me, he said, Joey, I'm never feeling that again. I will never feel that <laughs> feeling again. Yeah, yeah. And he came back, he got it done. Oh! <laughs> He totaled 1,836.4 pounds and an impressive 565.24 dot score. This represented a 22.7% increase in strength over his four-year career at that point. When the awards were announced, the gold medal was placed around Russ's neck, a feeling which was incredibly validating. Not just because he had finally caught John Hack in terms of accomplishment, but he had taken the title away from the reigning champ. So when it came to Russ's world title claim, there will be no questions, no asterisks, no doubt as to whether or not he was one of, if not the best powerlifters on the planet. Despite Worlds being the pinnacle of powerlifting, winning it was just the beginning of the Russell era. About it, it's still kind of surreal to me, like I'm not even like really embodying the fact that uh, I, I'm like right now, for this year, I'm the strongest 83 kg powerlifter in the world. <laughs> that felt good to say. With IPF Worlds having taken place just four months before Nationals, Russ would have a relatively short turnaround for the next meet. Heading in with the intention to defend his title of Best in America, Russ and Joey Flex aimed to do just enough to win. With the high of the world title still hitting, Russ's plan was to coast into Nationals and continue to build his legacy. In October of 2019, Russ touched down in Lombard, Illinois for the 38th USAPL Nationals as confident as ever. Given the fact that he was him, the numbers were going to be bigger than ever. It was just a matter of how much bigger were they going to be. I mean, that I honestly, you're not, it's, it's such a cliche, you're not popping until you got haters. Well, Russ started off pretty big with a 666.9 pound squat opener, which was his biggest opener of all time. Almost 30 pounds heavier than his previous biggest opener. Unfortunately for Russ though, it didn't count. Let's see what the refs say. No. But it wasn't a big deal given the fact that this weight was typically easy money for him. So he wasn't phased. So, all he did to make up for that was attempt a PR on his next lift, 691.1 to be exact. Russ had gotten to a point in his powerlifting career where he was comfortable making strategically bigger jumps so that he could conserve energy for his last attempt. Now, this second attempt also didn't count. Let's see what they say. Oh. So all Russ did was come back for his third attempt and actually make it count. 
officially nabbing another PR and breaking his national squat record once again. Beat life here. Russell is definitely fighting for that, and it's an unofficial world record on top of it. <laughs> to stay in the meet. You have to, you have to exceed the current world record because he missed his first two lifts, and you can't drop the weight below your previous attempt. So he's trying to exceed the current world record on his third attempt just to stay in the meet. And this is our final squat. Let's watch it. See what they say. He's got a smile on his face. See what they say. What made this even more vindicating was that John Hack had broken the national squat record over in the USPA at just 688.9 pounds, a few pounds lighter than Russ. It was crazy to see that Russ, who once lagged so far behind John, was able to eventually outshine him as an 83 kg squatter. When it came to the bench, Russ decided to employ his usual strategy of conserving energy. His squat and deadlift were just that good, so good that he could minimize his performance in the bench and still dominate. He opened up at a solid 402.3 his opener from the previous two meets. After nailing that opener, he moved on to 418.8, which he nailed as well. He finished with a bench of 424.4, which was good for second best all time for his career. Oh, it looks like he's got it. Wow. I mean, it was, it came See up, the lights are. started three wide lights. Ready to go all out on deadlifts, Russ opened up with a massive 677.9 pounds. This was followed by 711 pounds, which he hit smoothly and route to his biggest deadlift attempt of all time. 722 was loaded on the bar for what would be the biggest deadlift of Russ's career. He's already got the gold medal around his neck. This is just because I can. Indeed. Watch this. He's going to pull this. I think he's going to pull. If he pulls this, what would you give him for a total? Oh, so close. It would have been 8.33.5. The lift ultimately did not count, but this didn't matter though, as Russ still finished with a 1,826.5 pound total, 90.4 pounds more than the runner-up Sean Noriega. The big discrepancy primarily came in the squat, where Russ outsquatted him by 96 pounds, a gap so large that making it up in the next two movements seemed almost insurmountable. Sean did outbench Russ by 27 and a half pounds, but that wasn't nearly enough to catch up, especially with Russ deadlifting 22 pounds more than him. Now, this disparity in the squat between Russ and the rest of the 83 kgs in the country is astronomical. To be squatting almost 100 pounds more than the next best guy is what really solidified that Russ truly was an immovable force, a speeding train that couldn't be stopped. His leverages and mechanics, especially in the squat and deadlift, were truly elite and a masterclass, an example to all other powerlifters on how to maximize your movements for your body type. Russ left Illinois a three-time national champion, new squat record holder, and a reputation as one of the strongest men on earth. Uh, yeah, for the past couple of, uh, I want to say since, when was it, maybe like Raw Nationals or like maybe like in that weird period of time when we were going to Raw Nationals and we got back from Raw Nationals. Um, so that was like October. I've had the kind of mindset of I'm creating my own gym. Like I was like, I wanted to kind of push for it and uh, start visualizing and kind of getting things together in order to make that happen. And it's now January, what, January 7th, 2020. And we're finally basically moving. Like this is, this is, uh, this is really happening now. 2020 was a pivotal year for Russ. For starters, he had finally decided that it was time to open up a gym. See, over the years, Russ's success in powerlifting had an immense effect on not just the powerlifting community in Houston, but the greater powerlifting community in America. The purpose of his kinesiology degree in the long term was to open up a gym to train high-performance athletes, because he always had a love for athletics in peaking the human body for maximum performance. So he had always wanted to open up a gym, but had been putting it off for years. So he finally decided to carry out the idea that he had been pondering for a really long time and went and pulled the trigger. He had gotten to a place where building a gym made legitimate financial sense for him and his brand. His brand awareness was the biggest in all of powerlifting and it reflected in his social media following. What was most important was that those followers weren't empty followers. They were there to support Russ no matter what he did. Powerlifters were flocking whatever gym Russ trained at simply to be in the presence of greatness. So he didn't need Alphalete or any other gym. He had a tangible herd of powerlifters who would want to buy into his movement. 
and this cult following would subsequently grow his gym and the community around it. But before he could begin investing, he needed to continue to add to his team. New members who not only aligned with his vision but were just as passionate about it as he was. This team helped Russ build the foundation of his new gym and what it would eventually become. Now, the success of most businesses stems from a strong brand identity. Russ being Russ Swole understood this very well. However, he didn't want the gym to be exclusively associated with him. He wanted it to be its own entity, centered around the sport of powerlifting. With that came the most important aspect of a brand's identity, the name. So I was driving and uh, we were all trying to, so I have like this group, um, before I even started the gym, I'm like, hey guys, I wanna start a gym. This is the team that I want. Um, you guys are gonna be like my core group people that are gonna help me get this done. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, number one, we need a fucking concept and a like idea of what we're gonna go towards in like, regards to the gym. So we were all blanking and I think we were blanking for like about a couple of, maybe a couple of weeks. And uh, I'm the type of person, I'm very spontaneous. Yeah. So like ideas just kind of come to me. And I remember I was making a late night run to get some Ben and Jerry's at Walgreens. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and I think I was listening to a podcast and they brought up something about corruption. Like it was like politics or corruption or some shit like that. And then um, I'm like, damn, corrupted strength. That's a cool word. I was, like, that, that, I was like, that flows, but it doesn't really make sense. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I'm like, if I put it in the chat, I'm like, yo, corrupted strength. No one said anything. It doesn't have to make sense. Yeah. Though. And I was sitting there, I was like, okay, maybe it doesn't make sense. But I'm like, okay, no, no, no that like i'm gonna flip this idea to get what i want to get out of it so i'm like all right corrupt the strength how can we make that mean something so i looked at it and i'm like all right as power lifters we all have different walks of life we all have our daily jobs and we corrupt who we are as individuals to come inside of the gym and become like weight mo weight, uh, weightlifting monsters or whatever all right um so that's where that concept came about and i've always been a fan of like japanese culture and like anime and all that type of stuff so the logo was a uh, oni mask which is like to ward off like bad oh. spirits and all that kind of stuff yeah so then I sent that over to, to the designer. He created a whole brand manual for it, and that's how Corrupted Strength came about. With the name and logo figured out, Russ needed to find a location. He found a space in Stafford, Texas that would be perfect for powerlifting. Not too big, but not claustrophobic either. It was perfect for what he was looking for. So perfect, in fact, that he signed a lease at the end of 2019. Now, in terms of buying equipment, Russ didn't want to devalue the aesthetic and environment by putting in either low-quality equipment or pieces that didn't match the vibe. See, the vision for Corrupted Strength was to combine the feel of a traditional powerlifting gym with the aesthetic and ambiance of a modern gym. Old school and gritty with a modern flair and style. So with a $100,000 budget, Russ brought his vision to fruition. Why can't powerlifters have nicer things like that? Like we could definitely, I could definitely give the experience to the other lifters. Um, so when I created Corrupted Strength, I just wanted to give that gritty environment while also obtaining like a quote unquote bougie um, yeah. experience. He made sure that all of his pieces were the same color and came with the Corrupted Strength logo. The gym also reflected Russ's love for bodybuilding by including accessory equipment that would appeal to not just bodybuilders, but the new generation of powerlifters as well. The powerlifters that Russ inspired to heavily incorporate accessory movements. The gym was a representation of the evolution of the powerlifting space and reflected what modern powerlifters were looking for, which subsequently created an experience that was going to make Corrupted Strength a destination gym for powerlifters across the country. And this is exactly what Russ always wanted. He even started working on Corrupted Strength merch, which would be separate from GBT. And it was clear that he had something special brewing. Something so special that over time, it would transcend just being Russ Swole's gym. With a target opening of 2020, he was ready to elevate his brand and empire to a new level. Being as busy as he was, he wanted to allow his team to focus on the day-to-day -day while he focused on building the culture. breaking developments in the coronavirus emergency in the U.S. and around the world. The breaking news, stay at home. That is the order tonight from four state governors. Also pulled from the apartment, forcibly taken down the stairs. And as the market's reaction to the outbreak causes concern for many of us, overseas the situation there is already very serious. The pandemic ravaged small businesses and many would not be able to survive. The powerlifting community was no exception. As in June of 2020, Raw Nationals was canceled and Collegiate Nationals was postponed until November. In July of that year, IPF Worlds was also canceled as the IPF wanted to make the health and safety of athletes a priority. Now, as anyone in the fitness community knows, gyms were among some of the hardest hit businesses in the world, impacting the physical and mental health of millions of people. I myself was doing everything I could to get even the slightest pump during the time. Or apparently refusing to give police his personal information after a workout inside the Atelier's gym. We walked beside them as officers escorted some gym members to their cars, asking for ID. 
Contrary to a lot of gyms that were affected, the hit on Corrupted Strengths was even worse, as the gym had to postpone its opening for an entire year, hitting Russ right in the pockets. Now, despite this adversity, Russ has always been a big picture thinker, someone who always believed that he could do whatever he set his mind to, and was no stranger to determination. So, he used the one tool he had become a master at to benefit the gym in the long run, social media. What's up, MTV Cribs? Welcome to my gym. Come on in, man. All right, so right here we have the front office space. This is where we kind of chill, kick it, relax. Maybe you finish up your workout, you pull up to the couch, you chill. Let me show you guys the couch. This is my favorite part. Big chilling. You know what I'm saying? Grab a nice little picture, flick up the gram. Welcome to the fridge. So we have our choices right over here. We got, you know, the fruit punch, red Gatorade, and we got the blue, cool blue Gatorade. I mean, you know, Gatorade sends them out every now and then, you know what I mean? Like, if I'm missing a little something, I might send in a little care package to take care of your boy. Well, let me show you the office where I get my work done. My office. It's not really of anything. It's more so of what you guys believe it is. What do you guys see when you look in here? The, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Russ spent a lot of time in 2020 promoting and marketing Corrupted Strength in an effort to build maximum hype leading up to the grand opening. A grand opening that would feel like Christmas to a lot of powerlifters. Along with the added anticipation that Russ's marketing would create, the pandemic would serve another benefit to Russ in another big way. Growth. See, with the two biggest meets of the year for Russ being cancelled, he had no choice but to use 2020 as an offseason. The first long offseason of his entire career. Since 2015, Russ had been competing in 2-3 meets per year, with his longest gap off being 10 months. And this gap was very early on. He had been grinding his way to the top while taking shorter and shorter periods to grow, and yet he was still getting better. So with the state of gyms in limbo and no set end date for the pandemic, Russ knew he'd have the most time he's ever had to improve, which to the rest of the competition had to be terrifying. Tell me to end, before I end the video, I just kind of wanted to announce to you guys that a lot of people have been commenting, yo, when's CS opening? I can't wait until CS opens, blah, 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 this and that. Like, bro, when this gym opens, it's going to be dope. I've actually been kind of like sitting back and then like surveying the playing field and just like paying attention to the news and stuff like that. And I think, not think, but we're, I'm most likely leaning towards opening in 2021. I remember in January, I kind of announced to you guys that I was creating Corrupted Strength to be opened hopefully by the summertime. But the way that things are working out, like in terms of getting custom equipment made, getting equipment down here, and just like the delayed time with the whole um, virus situation, it's been a little bit kind of like a, a process, right? So. I want to be able to have this gym open under like the best circumstance. I mean, there's never going to be a perfect circumstance for a gym to open, but in terms of just being able to have everyone come down for like a huge like quote unquote block party and, and grand opening, and that cannot be done if uh, you know people are still uncomfortable to travel and it's just taking a little bit longer than we anticipated for the equipment to come in due to the fact that there's a limited amount of people that are able to work on the custom equipment. Russ spent the entirety of 2020 just building. From his business ventures to his physique, GBT was seeing massive growth in popularity across the fitness scene, and Corrupt the Strength was continuing to gain some massive hype. Most importantly, however, Russ was getting stronger. With his squat being his most impressive movement, Russ was showing off some massive gains. Hitting new single and rep PRs at a seemingly abnormal rate, the anticipation for how drastic Russ's improvements would be was incredibly high. Everyone wanted to know how one of the strongest men in the world would do after over a year's worth of improvements. The next time I step on the platform, I'm gonna be a whole different human being. This is almost like when Goku, it's kinda like when Goku knew, right? And the whole Z team knew that there was a big threat coming and they went into the hyperbolic time chamber to train and came back stronger. This is like that moment. So I get to go into the hyperbolic chamber the next time you see me, the next di the next time you guys see me on the platform, I'm gonna be a whole different individual. I might be squatting 650. I might be benching 450. I might be pulling 750. 2020 also saw Russ enter one of the most divisive conversations in the entire fitness industry: the Natty or Not debate, spearheaded by YouTube's Natty or Not authority, Coach Greg. Coach Greg, and today it's a Natty or Not video on Ryan Dangler. He's an Alpha Elite sponsored athlete. Not Gymshark. He's 20 years old, six foot one and a half, 225 pounds of pure beefcake. 
It was inevitable that Russ would publicly have his natty status in question given his combination of mass, aesthetics, and overall strength progression. It wasn't unreasonable for anyone to at least wonder if Russ might have been enhanced, but like many natural lifters alike, Russ used to defend his natural status very hard until he realized that what other people thought didn't really matter. But the fake natty claims, like, uh -huh. how do you deal with all that shit nowadays? I don't, I don't care. It doesn't bother, like, I think when I first started, it bothered me. But, like, now that I'm, like, I know that I'm not taking mm -hmm. anything, why, why should it bother me? Like, that's your opinion. You know, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not fact. So, I yeah. mean, like I said, it's, I think it's funny because, um, what's that guy's name that he, he does, like, the fake natty stuff. He has, like, a very, oh, like, high-pitched voice. The Greg Doucette. Yeah. He actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, he called me out. He's like, this guy is an natty. <laughs> hey, that's pretty good. Yeah, that was <laughs> really good. Oh, shit. <laughs> Russell or high. I was like, I was like, okay. And I made a response video. And then he ended up, like, retracting what he said. He did make a response video to Greg's claims in the most Russ Swole fashion, where he calmly made some very valid counterpoints to Greg's original video. When it came to, when it came my turn to get the whole natty or not conversation, I wasn't bothered because I just look at it as straight up entertainment. At the end of the day, I do what I do. People are going to have opinions on that. Um, it is what it is. I'm very comfortable um, kind of where I'm at now. It's just like, look, I work out hard, you know, I do it naturally. Um, I compete in a natural federation for powerlifting. And people will take what, from that what they will take. Like, they're gonna, some people are gonna believe I'm natural, some people are not gonna believe I'm natural. That's not my goal with this YouTube channel, or my goal when it comes to lifting, to proving whether or not I'm natural. But um, the only thing that kind of annoyed me with this video is the fact that this dude didn't mention that I am, like, I am the world record holder in the 83 kg weight class. Like, I am quite literally the best 83 kg lifter in the IPF in the world. And he didn't mention that. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because when you compete in the IPF, you get OMTs. So OMTs are out of meat testings. For the people that are watching my YouTube channel or people that are subscribed to me already, you know that I get tested frequently <laughs> out of meat. I literally have people coming up to my door um, around the year testing me. This only strengthened his case as a natural athlete. Greg did respond to this video by retracting his original claim of Russ being unnatural, which was a rarity for the subjects of one of his Natty or Not videos. Natural in a previous video. And the reason I did that was mostly based on the fact that I'd seen him post a picture uh, saying he was 14 years old, looking like he man. I watched the video and then I reached out to him and said, uh, I'm only right 99.6% of the time, and this is one of those times when I'm wrong. So this video is me responding to Russell to clear everything up and to say, I actually got this wrong, and I actually now think he's natural. This guy has freaky one in a billion genetics, and he's able to get this jacked and this strong natural. This concluded a very entertaining little back and forth between the two, which brought a decent amount of publicity to both. Regardless of what Coach Greg said, claims against Russ's natural status had always been and always will be present. However, he's a national and world champion in the most stringent drug-tested federation in America. His origins are from a part of the world where the people are genetically predisposed to building a lot of muscle tissue. To top it all off, he began building an athletic foundation at a relatively early age and had been training consistently since. That's not even to mention the fact that he can get drug tested randomly at any given moment. So when it comes to genetic gifts, it was clear that given the circumstances, Russ was a part of that 1% group. After all, this is the man that eats two meals a day and a snack, trains fasted, and still moves weight like this. Corrupted strength would also hold a mock meet that Russ would use as a tune-up to get ready for the next competitive season. But with the turnout, setup, and vibe, it would lay the groundwork for what would eventually become something very special. With the pandemic dying down and society returning to some normalcy, the USAPL went back to business as usual. With nationals set for June of 2021, it was time for Russ to remind people why he was called the king of the 83s. He had been making impressive progress heading into the meet and there wasn't a question as to whether he would dominate again. The question was, how much stronger was he gonna be? We'd find out on meet day. I think like even in high school, I just looked at like I just looked at the bigger boys, and I'm just like, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to your point eventually, and it's gonna be awkward when I am, cause like I'm smaller. Right. So it's just like I'm gonna get to that point eventually. He opened up with a relatively conservative 661.4 pound squat to conserve maximum energy for his second attempt at 692.2, a new PR and national record. 
Given how that squat moved, it was clear that Russ was going to smash his squat record and probably hit something in the 700s, something which hadn't been done in the history of the 83kg in the USAPL. So 712.1 was loaded onto the bar for Russ as he'd attempt to make history once again. Once again, Russ smashed his own squat record and continued to set the standard for the rest of the 83s. He'd continue his tactic of coasting through bench by opening up at 407.8, a number that was easy money. He'd continue on the conservative track with a 418.8 bench followed by 424.4 pounds. It had been well established that bench wasn't Russ's strong suit, but he was more than competitive enough to dial it back and still dominate. This has been a method that's consistently kept him ahead while allowing him to max out his deadlifts. His final bench wasn't an all-time PR, but it was close enough. And now it was time for deadlifts, where Russ had consistently brought it. He opened up with his biggest all-time opener at 688.9 pounds and crushed it. So there was no doubt that the final attempt would be a big one. Having failed 722 at his previous nationals, Russ made it a point to disrespect that weight and nab a new PR on his second attempt. So there was no doubt that the final attempt would be a big one. 738.5 pounds was loaded onto the bar for a new PR attempt. Despite a valiant effort, Russ would not get this one in the books. But being the competitor that he is, this would just be more fuel for the offseason. Now, despite missing that final attempt, Russ once again came out on top and earned the title of four-time national champ. He finished with an all-time best total of 1,858.5 pounds and a DOS score of 570.89. Now, the gap between Russ and the rest of the 83s was not as large as in previous years, as the competition had brought it in 2021. While his 2019 win saw him ahead of Sean Noriega by 90 pounds, the second place finisher Delaney Wallace was only 45.2 pounds behind Russ in 2021. In fact, the third, fourth, and fifth place finishers all had higher totals than Sean's second place performance in 2019. Granted, if he hits his final deadlift, this gap would have been greater. The rest of the competition did prove that they were ready to rise to the challenge taken down, and it showed at 2021 Raw Nationals. The torch that John Hack passed to Russ is something that he took and sprinted with all the way to international acclaim. He had become known as one of the best squatters in all of powerlifting, a title which was well deserved. However, no matter how much stronger Russ had gotten, the question of how much more would loom in the back of everyone's minds. Overall, great day at Russ's gym opening. Uh, Corruptor was amazing today. We had like, maybe like 250 people, in, 250 people in the building. Um, pretty cool. Um, met some guys who ran my program, guys who've been following me forever. So that's pretty dope as fuck. I'm so proud of my boy Russell, proud of everything that he's done, all the work that he's put in to the gym and, and just all the people that he's gathered around himself, you know what I mean? Like, we just respect him and have that same mentality of always getting better. So I'm, I'm honored to call my friend, honored to be sponsored by the Get Better Day brand. And honestly, today was just, it was a good day and I needed it, so. Fifteen days after winning his fourth national title, and just four years after the grand opening of Alpha Elite Gym, Russ would have a grand opening of his own. One that ended up being one of the most highly anticipated gym openings of any influencer within the industry. He didn't even know what he had on his hands in the beginning, because the monthly membership fee was $35, an insane value given the quality of the gym it was relative to the competitors in the area that were charging way more. So after some convincing by Naka CEO Charlie Coker, Russ increased the membership fee to $64.99, much more in line with where it should have been. I don't know what we were doing, but I was in Charlie's office with his uh, business partner, Sam. And <laughs> we were talking about Corrupted, I'm like, yeah, it's about to open. Like, uh, I think we were talking about like, having them uh, have a booth. And uh, he's like, yeah, so what are you gonna charge for, uh, for, uh, for a membership? So I'm like, uh, I think like probably like $35. 
And you know when you say something, <laughs> you, know, you, you know you say it again, everyone's just kind of like quiet. And <laughs> you're, like, you're like, okay, maybe that wasn't a good idea. Charlotte goes, damn. <laughs> you really? And see, like Sam, who doesn't talk at all, yeah. like Sam was just kind of like, you should definitely bring that up. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, he's like, bro, like you're, you're Russ Swole, like you're, this, he's like, bro, I've been to that gym. That gym is not a $35 a month type yeah. of gym. So that's when we were, that's when I was like, okay, like let's bump it up. Um, so we did 50, I think we did 59. And then honestly, I think I looked at a gym that I'm not going to say any names, but I was just like, we are way, yeah, <laughs> way better than them. Like in terms of just equipment, what we have to offer. So I was like, we need to bump it up even more. So. Get on Shursky better day. You truly exemplify that, man. Like in your lifting, your everyday life. Like, man, let me tell y'all right now, man. This is somebody where I can call anytime, and he'll listen to whatever I have to say. He don't even have to give a damn about it, but he'll listen to what I have to say. And you encourage all of us to get better every day, not only in lifting but in life, man. You encourage me to want to be a better coach, a better lifter, a better husband, eventually a better father. And I appreciate you for that. And all the work that you put in here and all the work that people are willing to put in for you is because you motivate us to do that. Like, you're worth putting in that work for that. I think I speak for everybody here when I say we appreciate you. We met, I met a kid the other day. He moved from Philly to Houston to, to train at Corrupted. And he's like, I just wanted to be down here because the vibes look good. I was, yeah. like, I, was like, uh, I was like, what the fuck? Despite all the motion going on for us, the grind wouldn't stop in his competition prep as IPF World was right around the corner. However, Russ was put at an interesting crossroads. See, two months out from 2021 Worlds, the USAPL split from the IPF due to ongoing disputes around drug testing. Specifically, the USAPL was not willing to comply with the IPF standard drug testing protocol, prompting the IPF to suspend the USAPL. This was massive news in the powerlifting space as it represented a barrier for USAPL athletes to be able to compete in the IPF world, the most prestigious international powerlifting meet. For us, this meant that he would have to leave the USAPL in favor of the IPF's new American affiliated federation to continue to compete on the IPF stage. But with the USAPL suspended indefinitely and so much still up in the air, Russ would continue to compete in the USAPL and wait things out. USAPL got suspended by the IPF, and that means that I can no longer compete in IPF Worlds. And there's also a decision to make with which federation do I want to go with. Do I want to go with a federation that will eventually be started to stay under the IPF umbrella, or will I do the USAPL Pro Series and stay USAPL lifter and just kind of like, I guess, do that going forward? IPF Worlds is happening. <laughs> I'm on prep, once again. I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to talk about this on camera or like make it a big deal just because number one, a lot of things are changing. Um, hell, even this whole situation can change. But as you guys kind of saw before, I would talk about prep and then wasn't sure if anything was happening, wasn't sure what the relationship with the USAPL and the IPF, how that was going and how that would play out. But it seems as though we're on a stable track to compete in Sweden. Um, so I'll be competing for the US Virgin Islands I will probably make another video explaining everything in detail as to how this is happening and, and why it's possible. Um, but for the moment, just know that I'm on prep and we will be competing at IPF Worlds September 30th. So Worlds was scheduled for September instead of June due to scheduling disruptions from the pandemic. With the meet returning back to Sweden, Russ would have to take on the daunting task of defending his coveted world title. With the competition coming fiercer than ever, Russ had to go into 2021 Worlds with the mentality of an underdog, the mentality of someone who had something to prove. Given the relatively short turnaround from Nationals to Worlds, the expectations for a massive increase wasn't necessarily there, because despite how strong Russ was, at the end of the day he was still a human, and replicating his massive performance would be difficult in such a short amount of time. But if there was anybody who can defy human norms, it was him. So as 2021 IPF Worlds came around, it was time to see whether or not Russ would retain. And there's a reason why people will never achieve what you've achieved in your lifting career and, you know, in your life because they don't have the same mindset. When that was an absolutely massive squat in the yeah, 83s absolutely. in a world record, now it's opening weight for Russell Orhe. By the way, did you see his arrival? Did you see how he arrived here in the building? No, sir. Was it by he limo? He was all suited up <laughs> with black lacquer shoes. <laughs> nice. Like a real king. He started out fairly conservative on squats, opening up at 655.8 pounds and made a big jump to 691.1. Listen to the silence. 
you could hear a pin drop. This was similar to his first two attempts at the previous Nationals. However, we wouldn't see Russ PR on squats as he'd conservatively attempt a 706.5 pound squat that he'd nail and break his own world record. Streaming on there in 20.5 kilos and 83 kilo pass. So we opened up relatively light just because the judging has been very, very strict uh, this past meet. And two meets ago, depth was somewhat of an issue. So making sure there's, we hammered it, got opener in. And then once I started feeling it, I had my legs under me. I'm like, all right, off to the races. He'd follow his usual bench pattern as he'd hit conservative numbers all across the board. A 396.8 opener followed by 407.8 for a second attempt and finishing bench off with a 413.3 pound bench. These weren't his best numbers by a mile, but were consistent with his bench methodology. Combine that with Ross not having hit his competitive peak for the year, and it was not a surprise that his bench would be on the lower end. But he couldn't cap off worlds on such a conservative note. He needed to finish off deadlifts with a bang, and to try to at least match his Nationals performance. After opening up with a 683.4 pound deadlift, and following that up with 716.5 pounds, Russ went into his last attempt intending to hit an all-time PR. With 734.1 pounds loaded onto the bar, Russ would hit the platform and attempt what not only would be his new personal best, but a new world record as well. So 841 will be the IPF world record should he be successful with an IPF deadlift record. And there is your 83 kilo world champion. And just like that, Russell Orhe was now a two-time world champion to go along with his four national titles. He capped off his third world appearance with a 1,854.1 pound total and a 569.22 dot score. A slight decrease from his last performance, but it didn't matter because Russ didn't need to be perfect. He didn't even need to be close to it because his okay performance at Worlds that year was still enough to dominate the competition, as the next closest 83 kg contender wasn't even within 100 pounds of his total. His dominance was becoming more persistent, and his legacy more cemented. He was undeniably great, and so far ahead of the competition because of his squat that he just had to come in 1% better than last time to win. The victory also validated his desire to continue power building, as the added muscle tissue allowed him to move in different planes or when he needed to make changes mid-meet, and that was on display at Worlds. Russ, however, does acknowledge that there is a drawback, and that being that he can't always be at his strongest, but still being able to win a world title clearly showed that the pros outweighed the cons for him. We got situated in the hotel, uh, got our rental car for the weekend, and uh, first things first, fucking look. At the end of the day, y'all know what we do. We got Miranda here, we got Miles here, we got Jamal here, we got the whole team here. Valentine's Day 2022. I made the trip with a couple buddies of mine to King of Prussia, Pennsylvania to attend the GBT pop-up and finally get to meet Russ Soul. As I nervously stood in line watching him meet fan after fan, I got ready to document the encounter. Yeah. 
And this was the exact moment that I realized that the Russell or he that portrays himself on camera is exactly the man that you would meet in person. Now, given the fact that this happened over a year ago, I don't expect Russ to still be on the lookout for this video. So I'm going to be counting on every other Russ Wolf fan to help me make it happen. Oh, and while we're at it, comment down below who won that pose off. My name is Russell Orhi. I am the CEO and owner of the Get Better Today brand, LLC. Um, so I started the Get Better Today brand back in like 20, I want to say 17, but we say 2015 here because that's when I basically started my fitness journey and started documenting what I was doing. And I had this phrase that I would say all the time, which was get better today. And the concept behind that is if you can get 1% better or just an inkling better every single day, um, you'll probably re end up reaching your goals. In the summer of 2022, GBT launched their Summer 1.0 and 2.0 collections, which marked a major turning point for the company. Their projected annual revenue increased dramatically from those launches, taking the athleisure scene by storm and surprising Russ in the process. The little clothing brand that Russ established back in 2015 had become the clothing brand at the forefront of the newest generation of powerlifting. The brand had finally hit their core demographic and became a manifestation of Russ's fashion sense. See, one thing that Russ had become known for was incorporating GBT with other fashion in the gym. As previously mentioned, Russ had always loved fashion and clothing. However, being somewhat of a recluse on top of perpetually being busy made Russ have very little use of his nicest Jordans, so he wore them to the only place he frequented the most, the gym. This marked the turning point in fashion within powerlifting. Boasting a Cuban link chain with a tank top, GBT shorts, and some fresh Jordans, Russ established his signature look, one that many more emulated. This just further exemplified Russ's influence within the powerlifting community. Whatever Russ was wearing, everyone else wanted to wear, whether they were wife beaters, crop shirts, or the signature GBT singlets. In black culture, right, like, mm -hmm. it's like you never really have, so like sometimes like showing that you have it is like wearing it on your body. In our culture, like expressing yourself and like showing that you have it is like what mm -hmm. you wear, because like that's the first like indication that you got it. While Russ was initially the designer for all GBT merch, as is customary for any business owner, he ceded those responsibilities early on so he could focus on other aspects of the business. So by putting the design responsibilities on someone more suited for that role, Russ helped the brand ascend to the next level. Every drop has followed a theme, with some designs telling a story and the entire drop cohesively flowing together like one masterpiece. Some drops have succeeded better than others. However, regardless of how each drop does, Russ and team have continued to get creative and push the envelope never being afraid to take risks. With Russ still being affiliated with the USAPL, he couldn't compete at 2022 IPF Worlds, so he opted for Mega Nationals instead, relinquishing his world title claim. Hey, what you do in the gym, it doesn't really matter. Like, you gotta be a performer. Like, you gotta be able to come in here and find, like, the bright lights and, like, put all these people and, like, still do what you do in the gym. Like, you don't get to control your environment anymore. Your dick, like, your lips are dictated by them. Pulling up in the only way that Russ Swoll could, he arrived in Vegas donning a mink coat while whooping the G-Wagon. When it was time to hit the platform at 2022 USAPL Mega Nationals, he opened up with a 655.8 pound squat, followed by a 684.5 pound second attempt, and he finished off with a 706.5 pound squat, matching what he hit at Worlds the year prior. This wasn't the massive jump that was expected given the amount of time that had gone by. In the bench, his numbers were identical to 2021 Worlds as well, with a 396.8 pound opener, followed by 407.8 and 413.3. He only pulled 722 this prep. I, I, I think I, my gut is telling me that if we jump 12 and a half, it's over. I think 7-Eleven is going to win. Okay. I'm not going to go over 733, I don't think. I don't think I don't want to. But if you do that, you feel your fucking total after being injured. That's crazy. Bro, this is crazy. We'll see how shit moves. Yeah, yeah this we'll is see crazy. How shit moves. That's in 7-Eleven's 
Deadloops followed almost the same exact pattern as his numbers would be almost identical to the previous world with the exception of his final attempt. Boy, I was like, if Russ come out of here and do this shit, like y'all can't, y'all gotta stop talking shit, bro. Y'all just gotta shut the fuck up. He finished off with a 727.5 pound deadlift, his second heaviest of all time. While Russ didn't hit any all time bests or break any of his national records, he still did enough to fend off the competition. Competition that, similar to the year prior, was not too far off his heels. He totaled 1,847 pounds and had a dot score of 568.87. Oh, and a fifth national title to go along with it. Despite these still being impressive numbers, it wasn't the massive jump that everyone was expecting. In fact, Russ was seeing a small regression in performance in his last three meets. This wasn't the first time Russ would experience that kind of regression, but it was the first time while being one of the best in the world, a status which put the entire powerlifting community on him. But if his numbers for mega nationals didn't seem as impressive as anticipated, it's because he was injured. Russ had tweaked his adductor squatting 12 weeks out from the meet, but was still determined to dominate the competition. Absolutely savage. But with his regression in performance combined with Delaney Wallace claiming the world title, the natural skeptics and trolls of the community would come out. So naturally, given Russ's social media status, the questions would start to mount among some of the more technical powerlifting fans in comment sections. Was Russ slowing down? Had he finally hit his peak at 27 years old? Was it the age that was catching up to him, or was it the pressure? These sentiments all seemed a bit absurd considering he was still on top. However, when looking at his numbers relative to his best, it seemed that Russ was stagnating a bit. Even if he was, it didn't really matter because he was still one of the best. But despite that, while being number one has always been the ultimate goal, putting up big numbers and consistently improving on them was just as important. Russ had always stood out from other powerlifters in his ability to entertain the crowd and get them going. The natural hype that came with powerlifting meets were amplified times 10 when Russ came out. The energy was just different. That is a part of the value that Russ brought to the community, outside of just being an excellent lifter and personality. But while the questions would mount, Russ would keep his career plans relatively quiet as he continued to build his brand and his empire. Now with the growth of GBT, corrupted strength, and Russ's entire business ecosystem, it only made sense for him to consider some bigger moves. The powerlifting community had been wondering why Russ hadn't organized the meet yet, but on November 5th, 2022, that would all change. He put on the inaugural Corrupted Strength Classic, which was initially billed and marketed as what was going to be one of the hypest USAPL meets of the year. With the competition being attached to Russ and his crew, it was expected that every powerlifter who followed the brand would want to get their hands on this meet. When the meet initially opened up for registration, competitor slots filled up within the hour, giving it some really high expectations. Well, the meet largely lived up to that. Being held at a different venue than the gym, Russ and team made sure to create an ambiance that was consistent with the brand. An ambiance and vibe that would resonate well with their core audience and fellow competitors alike. It was reportedly a huge success with some well-known names competing like Shamar Royster, Weez, and Gabby Martinez. With the turnout of his first sanctioned powerlifting meet, it was a foregone conclusion that the next year's event would surely take it to another level. Now, the fans started to suspect that Russ might have been wanting to scratch that itch for bodybuilding, as in mid-2022, he'd frequently post himself hitting mandatory poses. Russ announced that he was going to be prepping for a bodybuilding show to further challenge himself. I'm officially announcing here on my YouTube channel that I am currently in prep for a bodybuilding show. Whether I'm going to be competing in classic or bodybuilding, that's to be seen, but I'm cutting literally right now, so I'm down about five pounds. But I'll start documenting that journey when I'm about like eight weeks out. He had reached the pinnacle of powerlifting in his weight class two times over and didn't feel like he had many other obstacles to conquer. So he decided to set out on a new goal to get back on the bodybuilding journey and earn his IFPB Pro card. This decision was sparked by powerlifters gaining the ability to get accredited pro status. Russ being eligible for pro status as a powerlifter saw an opportunity to not only make history, but challenge himself to a different level. 
When I first started my lifting journey on social media, on YouTube and all that, I was motivated by people that did both. People that had amazing physiques and were strong as Back in the day, like these people were doing powerlifting and bodybuilding at the same time, right? So they do a powerlifting show and then kind of like switch over to bodybuilding. And I always, I was always like, damn, that's, that's so dope, being able to be a dual threat. And the concept of being a pro in powerlifting is new. That's something that happened this year, right? So the USAPL started announcing like, oh no, you're a pro powerlifter. So I'm like, okay, I wanna be a pro powerlifter and a pro bodybuilder. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be the first motherfucker to ever do that because the USAPL pro thing is a whole new concept. I know you have people like Stan Afferding that have done it at a high level, um, but I just wanna be the first ever by title, USAPL pro and IFBB pro. So Russ got not just the powerlifting community, but the bodybuilding community excited and speculating on how good he would look on a bodybuilding stage in his second appearance. This naturally stirred up a decent amount of debate regarding Russ as a bodybuilding prospect. Some felt he should do the open, while others thought his physique was more suited for classic. The guy has a ton of muscle in all the right places. Massive shoulder, arms, traps, chest, and a six pack. And this is his off season. Unbelievable. The general consensus, however, was that if Russ's goal was to turn pro, he could do it. This, however, would not materialize, as Russ would put his bodybuilding career on hold to compete at an invitational in South Korea set for December called the Career Winter Showdown. I'll just go ahead and say in this opening clip here that I'm no longer doing the bodybuilding show in, uh, in December. But there's a good reason for that. Trust me, I'm not dropping out. I didn't quit. I quit, but I didn't quit. I'll explain whenever we get to that. Right? Let's break this down in about two minutes. Oh, that's good. That's good. All right, let's break this down in about two minutes. I had every intention of doing my bodybuilding competition. I had every intention of doing it. I was actually married to the process. I was doing the cardio, I was posing, um, but an opportunity came completely out of nowhere. So I got a message from the USAPL Korea and they actually want to fly me out and have me compete in a, basically like a local meet over there and help push the sport of powerlifting over in their community. So I was like, damn, like I'm not even sure you don't go, those, those type of opportunities don't present themselves very often, right? So I was just looking at it from the perspective of like, I'm thinking of myself as an athlete, almost like a Kobe Bryant, a Tracy McGrady, uh, a Michael Jordan, where, you know, you go overseas to Asia and you promote sport of politics and helps boost like kind of like your overall audience, so. Uh. Russ not only wanted to hop on the opportunity to compete at a high profile meet overseas, but he wanted to make this meet one to talk about. It needed to be worth the anticipation. So he decided to move up a weight class. This was an interesting decision as Russ had become an international staple in the 83 kg. But it seemed like it was time. Time to step up and prove that he wasn't okay with staying comfortable or complacent. He was never going to stop proving something to himself. The last time Russ competed outside of this weight class was his third meet back in 2016. It was a decent performance but not where he could maximize his strength. Competing at the 90 kg would be a cornerstone moment for Russ's career as it would be an indicator as to whether or not it was time for him to move up. The goal with this meet was to push like powerlifting and just kind of like be here as a presence as one of the leaders in the community of powerlifting to kind of like push the culture more here in South Korea. When the career winter showdown came around, the entire community would be watching with extreme anticipation. The expectations that everyone had for Russ going in weren't just met, but exceeded. He opened up at a massive 699.9 pounds, but missed the lift. Three. Undeterred, he made a big jump to 722, which marked a 10-pound increase from his previous PR. This jump wasn't surprising given the weight class increase. What was surprising was how well that 722 moved. And after that lift, Russ had officially become the new 90kg squat record holder and still had one more lift to go.
And just like that, he'd break his own record once again. Now, what made his squat even scarier was the fact that it was 15.4 pounds more than his deadlift PR at 83 kg. Looking to conserve as much energy as possible, he kept it conservative on the bench by opening up at 402.3 and followed that up with a 418.8 pound bench. He'd match his all-time PR at 429.9 and nail it, setting himself up for a finish for the ages. Like, this is why I love sports so much. Like, you think you love playing this game until you actually meet someone that loves playing this game. Like, when you see someone that works, you think you work hard until you see someone that works hard. As we make our way to the deadlift, he opens up with a 705.4 and nails it. He then makes a huge jump to 738.5, which came up pretty easy as well. But for his final attempt, 771.6 pounds were loaded onto the bar for the second biggest deadlift of the entire meet. Russ had just deadlifted almost 800 pounds, a feat that even he himself couldn't have imagined when he started this journey. It was mesmerizing and well worth foregoing a bodybuilding show. Russ had proven that he was more than willing to take his talent to another weight class and make a serious impact. Russ finished with a 1,951.1 pound total and a dot score of 572.69, almost four points higher than mega nationals. So the idea that Russ might be slowing down was put to bed with his performance in South Korea. Also, just, man, shout out to Korea. I just heard them say that, but um, this place is fucking amazing. It's really cool. Everyone here is so welcoming and so nice. In 2023, Get Better Today underwent a massive rebrand to the Better brand. This rebrand was a strategic effort for Russ and team to position the company for sustained growth. It started out in a niche, but had expanded to a level where it made sense to branch out outside of powerlifting and athleisure and blend into casual wear as well. As I've grown GBT, right, it started as merch for Russ Wool. I had merch for Russ Wool and it graduated into like Get Better Today, which was more so like what I would say at the end of my videos. And it took on this whole movement and um, I, we've grown so much. And it was a way for me to connect the community that, that watches me. It evolved so much. Like we went from t-shirts to hoodies, to fanny packs, to hats. Like you guys that are listening, there's like this like orange and red comic book Marvel looking logo that I used to run with. And I just felt as though that didn't properly represent where I was at in my life and represent what I wanted to represent in my life. It was more so from an individual that was living back in like 2015, 2016. I was a younger person back then. I had different views. Um, and this was just a way to mature the brand. And I was like, we need to find a way to mature it. The brand had reached new heights, elevating Russ's business footprint tenfold. He also launched his podcast called The Better Take, where he spearheads conversations between himself and other notable figures in the fitness industry and on his team. With his progression as a businessman and working towards his personal aspirations, it only made sense for him to set up the foundation for his future after powerlifting. This was a part of the reason why Russ spent 2023 off the platform. He's entering a turning point in his career where he needs to decide his next move in terms of powerlifting. He is no longer the reigning world champion as Delaney Wallace currently holds the title for the second time after winning 2023 IPF Worlds. But Russ isn't going anywhere. He's clearly gearing up to make a huge splash at his next meet, whether it be in the 90 kg or 83. And based on the numbers he had been putting up and the ridiculous progression he's been displaying this offseason, it's clear that the king is going nowhere. Which is why in July of 2023, Russ announced on his channel that he would officially be leaving the USAPL. 
I'm leaving the USAPL. The reason why I'm leaving the USAPL is because I want to go back to being a world champion powerlifter again. Having decided to rock the bald look and seeming to have packed on some added size, the energy that Russ is going to be bringing in 2024 is going to be different to say the least. Now, despite no longer having the title, he was never dethroned. He never stepped on the stage as a world champion and had someone take it from him. So given the amount of time that Russ is taking to prepare for his inevitable return to the platform, it's going to be scary regardless of the weight class. Now, despite his glaring confidence, Russ has asserted that his internet personality is something he needed to get comfortable with, as he's always been a reserved person. He's also gone on to acknowledge that he isn't ruling out the possibility of hitting a 500 pound bench or even a 1000 pound squat, and with no signs of slowing down, nobody should put it past him. Most recently, Russ has been dealing with a few obstacles. The 2023 Corrupted Strength Classic was set to be bigger than the year prior, as it was going to be held at NRG Stadium in Houston, home of the Texans. The idea of a powerlifting meet being held at a football stadium was something that was unfathomable to most just a few years ago. However, leave it to Russ Swole to help make that happen. With the meet selling out just as quick as the year prior, there was no doubt that the 2023 Corrupted Strength Classic was going to be one of, if not the biggest meets of the year. But unfortunately for Russ and all the competitors who signed up, the meet would be cancelled. The Corrupted Strength Classic needed to be put on the back burner so that Russ and team could focus on keeping the business alive. This has to be the priority, as Russ has invested too much time and energy and money into building what it's become. We got notification from our landlord that uh, he has no desire to kind of like re-up on a new lease uh, following this year. We have like the rest of this month left that we have October in November and then um, December, right? So uh, the biggest thing is figuring out like a new location, if that, right? Um, the gym, the gym makes it up to like kind of keep itself even and stuff like that. But we have to look, number one, find a new location, find a location that we actually like, location that's available, and then move all this stuff over to a new facility. We also had to cancel CSC, right? So the Strength Classic isn't happening. The people that, I mean, if you're already watching this video and kind of already know about it, posted it. Um, but Corrupted Strength Classic 2024 or 2023 isn't happening just because of that reason. Despite the state of the gym being in limbo, Russ never had plans to expand. He always wanted Corrupted Strength to become a destination gym, a powerlifting oasis where fans and competitors alike could travel just to go experience. And the hope is, is that it stays that way, wherever it may be. Russell Orhe embarked on his fitness journey with the intent of being the best version of himself and started documenting it to inspire others to do the same. In the process, he reached heights even he could have never imagined he'd hit. He brought personality, swag, and bravado to a sport that lacked in all those apartments. And he blazed a trail that thousands would follow in the process. Russ cites Charlie Coker, Christian Guzman, and Max Schooning as some of his biggest inspirations in terms of success within the fitness industry and role models within his circle that pushed him to be great. Despite this fear of influence, he's always preferred to train by himself so he can go into that different realm. When Russ goes back to watch his old content, he can't help but get emotional sometimes, seeing how far he's come. From a kid from Houston with a dream, to multiple time national and world champion, he claims that the day he stops getting stronger is the day he's lost interest. The better brand has become a staple in the fitness industry, with Russ expanding his athletes to include some of the biggest up and coming powerlifters in the industry, like Jamal Browner, Cranin and Weeze, also along with Swole Ricketts, who brings a different demographic as well. With the brand having represented more to people than just clothing, its fan base has become one of the most dedicated and active fan bases in any athleisure brand out there. This latest era of powerlifting has truly been the Russell era, with his influence being seen all over social media and the entire powerlifting community globally. Russ has not only been a trendsetter, but a trailblazer as well, working towards being more purposeful and thoughtful of the people around him, as well as opening up on his mental health struggles, has really shined a light on who Russell or he is behind the muscle. What can we learn from the life of Russ Swole? It's that whatever you think you're capable of pales in comparison to what you can actually accomplish, because the moment you find your passion and lock in, you can become unstoppable if you want to. With his impending return to the platform keeping prospective competitors awake at night, the Russell Orhe story is clearly far from over. So it's only right that we say to be continued. I'm Large Kofi. Thank you for watching.